The following documents and recordings are the 12th installment in a compilation detailing the events of the repair team sent to Outpost Freestead, consisting of Dr. Rosa De La Torre, Walter Heath, Graham Kasner, Dr. Karina Schumacher-Weiss, and Jonas Thorison. In the winter months, Gau storms in Svalbard can reach wind speeds of 130 km per hour. Accompanied by or following snowfall, such storms can reduce visibility dramatically, more so in the winter months of the polar night. During these storms, travel is not advised. The White Vault. Following the previous instalment, the team considers what to do regarding the possible death of Dr. Schumacher Weiss and the unseen force that took her. The first recording comes from Mr. Heath's camcorder. Just turn it back on. It's on, all right, it's on. What, looking for documented proof of Karina's death? How about mine, no? Yours then? Walter, calm down. Yelling helps no one. Except the thing trying to find us. So be quiet. If we get it on camera, maybe we'll know what it is. We're all going to end up with our heart in a box if we don't get the fuck out of here. Let's go. Wait. No. I'm sorry. Karina is obviously dead. There's a heart in a box covered in teeth right in front of your eyes, and you're ignoring what that means. We're safer back in the bunker waiting out the storm, or better yet, storm be damned, let's try our luck out there. Travelling now would just end with us off a cliff. I'd rather fall off a cliff than end up like Karina. Stop! Rosa, Walter, Kastner, do we all believe Karina is dead? Yes. But where does the blood trail go? There is a heart in that box, Rosa. A fresh heart. So it's just her body. Lo siento mucho, Karina. I know that. I do. It's too much blood. I just hoped. So, we are in agreement. Let's get out of this hell. No. Why? Whatever took Karina got her from inside the bunker. It got through not one, but three doors and dragged her away. Going back to sit in that bunker is not going to miraculously keep us safe, Heath. So we get on the snowmobiles and drive out of here. It is not safe one way or the other. I am going to confront this thing. And I am not carrying that beating prune out of here. Let's get this over with. Where are you going? Down. You said we weren't going down there. I lied. goes anywhere alone, remember? This is the dumbest thing in, now I'm just guessing here, all of history. Shh. I'll go with you, Graham. I'm going where the shotgun's going. This, I, why is this happening? Yes, I'm coming, but we're only spending an hour here tops, then we head back. Reasonable. We don't know what's down there. Yes. Get out the flare gun, otherwise you two keep hold of your axes. Are you joking? Walter, move ahead of me and hand me the flare gun. Yes, absolutely. These stairs are very old. Everyone, tie these to your harness attachment. If anyone falls, we pull. If someone falls, the whole staircase will likely collapse. I hate to agree on that, but... Tie on and let's go. No more waiting. As the recording continues, there are several minutes of loud descending steps where speech cannot be clearly discerned. The following is another brief section of Mr. Heath's video diary recording on his personal laptop, which provides some insight into the descent. Kasner could not be dissuaded from going on a hunt for the thing. He thinks coming back here isn't safe, not with something out there opening doors and snatching people. I guess he's right. 
Regardless, idiotic decisions were made, and we all agreed to look for the thing with Kasner. So, as is perhaps the most ridiculous choice in my life to date, I tied myself to the others and went down the steps into the underbelly of the disgusting anatomical theatre. The stairs were covered in bloody ice, and <laughs> I honestly couldn't look down. The lower we went, the more surprised we were at the depth of the place, seeing as the town itself is already underground. Kasner strapped on a headlamp early on as the blue ice light quickly faded, and I got to use the night vision on my camera again. <laughs> Rosa had a small pen light, but Jonas had forgotten his flashlight back at the bunker. It was, um, <laughs> it was a mess. The further we went, the more the smell of rotten fish and burnt oil suffocated us. We went maybe three stories down before Kasner reached solid ground. The sound of crampons on pure rock is jarring. It was some type of cave system, some parts carved intentionally, others, others appeared natural, though. It is here we cut back to the camcorder recording of the team's exploration down the stairs of the anatomical theater. I don't have a light. Just hold on to my back. I'm not behind you. I have the flare gun back here. Then hold on to mine. I'm using the camera for this. Huh, night vision's white. I thought it would be green. Everyone stay close. We've never been down here, and we need to be cautious. Another reason we should just turn around and go back to the bunker. There, something. Something moved. I saw it definitely moved. What? What did it look like? I don't know, a tree? Branches moving in the dark black? I saw a skinny black thing. So did Karina. Stay close. No, espere el seu momento. Jonas, tie this off on the stairs. Whatever happens, we will not lose our way out. The cave rope was cut. This may end up just the same. I'd rather be cautious, regardless. Tired, but still pay attention to the path. Oh, the camera's malfunctioning. Lights, too. Everyone wait. Rosa, go in the first pocket on the right side of my bag. These? Yes, I have more. Crack. Four and pass them out. These are 30 minute high intensity light sticks. 15 minutes in, 15 minutes out. Has anyone seen the trail recently? The blood? The trail dissipated down the steps. Can't see any blood now. The camps are watchable. I'll just keep the audio for now. May'll be trash, but we'll see. Dios mío, these are the catacombs. The whole cave hall has been this way since the beginning. <laughs> Just tell me where not to look. Up. Don't look up. We're turning right. Stay it was here that Mr. Heath's camcorder recording was so degraded that it was no longer usable as a source of documentation. The following document is a written account by Mr. Thorison. It was found crumpled in the bin along with an earlier note. Veltu Karinu, fundum hjarta hennar í kassa í eitt af stóru steinbyggingunum. Af hverju er ég að skrifa þetta? Ég var aldrei lifið stelpunum lesið. We went after Karina. Found her heart in a box in one of the larger stone structures. I don't know why I'm writing this. I'll never let my daughters read this. It's too much. Too many horrible things. Perhaps I'm just trying to think this all through. My hand hurts so much now. But I dare not take the glove off. It's cold. We're all on edge. We don't need another problem. We went down those stairs, covered in teeth. A nightmare in the dark. We had lights, but soon after we descended, everything died. All of them at the same time. Walter's camera as well. Kastner had some chemical lights, but it really didn't help with the atmosphere. The ceiling was lined with skulls, like the lost catacombs of Svalbard or something, peering down at us with empty jaws and missing teeth. I guess they would have to be. It smelled horrible. The air was disgustingly heavy and humid. My skin still feels sticky. 
covered in oil and grit. We found the reason for the smell. We followed the caves, a mix of natural and carved, I believe, and found a long chamber lined with stone containers as large as barrels. Some even larger. Some could fit me inside them, certainly. Some could fit my Uncle Leo, the largest man I know. Rosa thought, with good reason, that they may have contained bodies, seeing as how they appeared as massive mimics of the perverse stone-carved heart boxes. Sarcophagi. The seals were larger, though, and looked to be preserved with a type of wax. Kastner set about crashing at the seal with his eyes axe before anyone had the time to protest, so engulfed with morbid curiosity. I don't think I would have. Rosa was the only one not to retch when the seal broke. Being a doctor, she probably smelt and seen worse. Wax cracked open and Kastner wets the eyes axe in, propping it up. The whole stone lid slit maybe 30 centimeters. The spell that rose out of it was the worst I've ever experienced. Rotten sludge filled the container to the brim, but it didn't appear as human remains. After we composed ourselves, Kastner said it looked like fetid whale oil, thick and coagulating with age. I glanced at it as far away as my green light would allow me, and dare not move closer. Walter protested for a return, but soon helped us set the lid back on the container. We continued on, being on a time schedule with our limited light sources. We were laying a line behind us as we went. Rosa's idea. Kastner remained on the guard for the creature that took Karina, but we never saw another glimpse of it, and the blood trail disappeared as we stepped from the stairs into those catacombs. Instead, we found something else. Skulls. Not human, but massive animal skulls and skeletons. Some taller than and longer than me. Longer than a bear or a whale. Longer than should have fit in the cave. I wonder, how did they get there? The massive ones were certainly those of whales, though I don't know what type. Some had jaws lined with teeth. Well, they did not. Other skulls scattered about had great tusks, overranging from perhaps 40 centimeters to a meter in length. Kastner believed them to be walrus skulls. To my memory, I had never seen a walrus skeleton before, but these were thick, dense skulls, some dark brown with age. Others, I think, were narwhal skulls, dozens maybe much larger than the others, some missing in their tusks, other laying strewed down with their tusks broken into pieces. All the remains looked aged, or even ancient, except for very few small fish skeletons. Some so fresh they could have been lunch. One set of remains was something we could find no explanation for. Perhaps, I believe, it was some amalgamation of bones from different animals, which the ancient inhabitants put together to construct some form of unnatural creature of worship. From what we could all piece together, it appeared with the massive size and skull of a blue whale, but with rows upon rows of teeth similar to that of a shark, certainly larger than those of a killer whale. From the front of its jaw, from where the canine teeth would sit, grew massive tusks jutting both from the upper and lower jaw. It grew in a spiral like that of the largest narwhal tusk I had ever seen. The limbs were squat and sturdy, with thick bones as large as and larger than my forearm. This way, I think it may have resembled a walrus or seal, but with elongated, delicate finger bones. I have never seen anything like it. Kastner attempted to take a picture with his portable roller camera, but I'm not sure it worked. It was massive, and the cave was only lit by our green lights, so the picture could not have come out too impressively regardless. How did it get in the cave? I should help clean up. The following is a short audio recording Dr. Della Torre took on her phone. The quality is lacking, but she has an insight not documented by her fellow team members. Toda mi vida he trabajo muy duro para convertirme en la doctora que hoy soy, para construir una vida mejor. I have worked hard all my life to be the doctor I am today. 
so I could build a better and more meaningful life than what my parents had planned for me. I knew it would be difficult. The years of training, the deaths, the disgusting things. I would do it all again. But this is evil. We went to find Karina's body and her abductor. We found neither. Only a heart and teeth. There is so much more to those caves beneath the theater than we could search in so little time. If she were there, we may never find her. If not, we could search and never know. I see enough death. I've been to Paris a few times. Never once have I chosen the catacombs as a place of leisurely sightseeing, though I had been to the Basilica e Convent di San Francisco and seen glances at the catacombs beneath my feet. There, the remains are treated like holy relics and art. But in those caves, they stare down at us like fiendish spies. We found a disgusting room with carved stone crates of rotting whale oil and fat. I did not wish to examine them further, but we were able to find another room while plodding around in the dark. A morbid circus of animal remains. Walrus, narwhal, whale, some types unidentifiable. One was a monstrosity. It was some massive chimera of sea mammals with tusks like a deformed walrus that spiraled similarly to a narwhal, rows of teeth like a shark, the size of a large whale, yet with long spindly flipper phalanges. I've never seen the likes of it, and I never wish to again. Jonas and Walter discuss how such a massive thing could have been brought into the room. But while examining the tail section, I noticed that parts of the skeleton looked to be embedded in the walls, as though it were being excavated from within the cave. We left in a rush. Graham had perfectly timed the chemical lights, and the thought of being stuck down there in the dark chills me more than the storm. At that point, we still thought the thing was down there. Now we know it wasn't. That bastard was here, destroying every piece of food it could find. Everything ransacked and tossed. Some things previously canned and well-preserved, now rotten. Unopened cans, checked and found putrefied. We may have found something. Oh, thank God. We're so hungry. The following is another brief section of a video diary recording by Mr. Heath on his personal laptop. Mr. Heath repeats much of the same information as Dr. Della Torre and Mr. Thorison, so part has been removed to allow time for the selected section. So, nothing killed us in the caves, but it may as well have. By the time we took the bloody trail back to the auxiliary bunker, we found our food supplies and stores thoroughly trashed. Not just upturned or the like, but rancid, like it had taken up residence in someone's compost heap. The door to the main bunker was wide open, and Kasner swept the place from top to bottom, but we found no sight of the thing that broke in. All the food gone. Well, not all. Jonas is pulling together as much as he can find that hasn't been deemed inedible. We might not have died down there, but we'll die of starvation up here if we don't leave for Neolison soon. Oh, and my computer was also turned over, but thankfully, it looks otherwise undamaged. Oh, fuck. Thinking about a fucking computer. Karina's dead, and something's trying to starve us out. So petty. We can't stay here. Storm be damned, we're leaving. This concludes those documents related to the search for Dr. Karina Schumacher Weiss, her killer, and the exploration of the catacombs. This completes the 12th collection of information regarding the repair team at Outpost Freestead. The White Vault. <laughs>